So today we have Neil Caparoso talking. He's from the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. He got his MD degree from the University of New Jersey. And then way back in 83, he came to NCI as an oncology fellow in the medicine branch. And he's stuck around all this time. Now he's the chief of the genetic epidemiology branch up at the Shady Grove facility where my office is. And the title of his talk today is Epidemiology. Neil. Thank you. So today we have some technical challenges. By the way, can you all hear me with the mic? OK, great. Um, I have to simultaneously click both of the slide advancers. So this will strain the limits of my coordination. So let's just hope it works out OK. So today I'm going to tell you about epidemiology, which is, of course, the most important lecture that you'll get in this series because it enables you to prevent all the other cancers. So I know um, we'll have fun. And uh, OK, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some basic concepts, some tools epidemiologists use, some things that have been accomplished in epidemiology, um, then some challenges, and then some ways the future of epidemiology will go. So uh, we are part of NIH. And under NIH is the National Cancer Institute. And my particular division, which I'll tell you about in a second, is one of the two intramural divisions of NCI. And intramural is special um, because we don't compete for grants exactly like the extramural world. Most of you, uh, most of the world, is out there writing grants. And that's about 85% of the money. But in the intramural, we get money allocated a certain amount of money, and we compete internally for that money. And you may say, well, how come you're not competing too? Well, we do compete internally, and also we are site visited every four years. And it's kind of a different kind of competition. If we're site visited and they don't like us, our lab is shut down. So, um, but the idea of the intramural division is that you get to sustain projects that are not necessarily popular. So we began doing family studies 30 years ago, and at the time, everyone thought human genetics was a waste of time. Really, if you want to do genetics, you should be studying Drosophila, and why waste your time on humans? But um, and so there have been a number of unpopular um, ideas that have kind of been sustained over time, and in fact, they've paid off somewhat. Um, OK, so this is uh, DCEG, the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. and there are a number of branches that focus on the environmental causes of cancer. And then there are a number on the genetic causes of cancer. And I'm on the genetic side. Our branch um, investigates cancer, genetics of cancer in families and populations. But there are other groups that look at occupation, that look at hormones, look at nutrition, uh, infectious disease, et cetera. And we have multidisciplinary research teams of epidemiologists, physicians, um, oncologists, geneticists, et cetera. And our goal is to identify the environmental and genetic causes of cancer in the population. I'm not going to go into this in great depth. Um, a lot of public health advances have um, emerged from the work of our group and others, but specifically regulatory changes in water, uh, less benzene and gasoline, workplace safety, um, farming. It's kind of you know, you just throw up a line like this, workplace safety, diesel. The study of diesel exhaust um, was fought viciously by a, a number of um, advoca advocacy groups. Um, and um, it was an extremely difficult study to uh, pull off. In fact, the occupational group was called before Congress a few times. And so it was a difficult study to do in the public health. It was clear that diesel exhaust um, is related to lung cancer. Um, so there have been clinical studies of cancer susceptibility syndromes and a lot of studies of second cancers um, di and different preventive interventions like how to do safer CAT scans, um, risk-reducing surgeries, uh, benefits of healthy weight, et cetera. And um, there are collaborations around the world. I have. Um, a principal investigator that just came back from Beijing, and Saturday she left for Kenya. So um, and she has breast cancer studies in both places. 
And if you go on the web, you can find us and learn all about the kinds of studies that we do. And if you go on the web, you can also find some risk assessment tools. OK, so enough about our group, uh, some basics of epidemiology. The term epidemiology uh, comes from uh, study of people, in other words, populations. We don't study individuals, clinical studies. We don't study cells. We don't study molecules, except as secondary uh, goals. We study groups of people. And these are observational uh, studies. So um, they're not experimental studies. You can't um, assign people to smoke cigarettes. Okay, that's not ethical. And that's a weakness of the epidemiology design. And it's one that tobacco companies and other groups have exploited to question the validity of epidemiologic findings. Um, so as I said, epidemiologists are ethically prohibited from experimenting upon people. So we observe large populations and essentially do um, studies that uh, observe the outcomes in people and the exposures that people take on and then do statistical analyses to try to determine the differences. Generally, the goals of epidemiology, in particular the goals, the central goal of our group is to understand the causes of cancer. Um, we also want to quantify risks, understand mechanisms, um, have uh, implications for public health, and identify syndromes. One of the features of epidemiology is that we emphasize prevention. Okay, unlike clinical medicine, which looks at curing disease, which is a wonderful thing. I'm a physician. I'm totally in favor of it. Um, but the idea of prevention is that it's very effective. Okay, and you think of vaccines. It's much less expensive. It's oriented towards public health. And it eliminates disease early, before you have health consequences. But there are some real big problems to prevention. The biggest problem is that it takes a lot of time to demonstrate that something works. Um, it's much less dramatic than treatment. You don't have grateful patients coming to you and saying, you cured me. Okay, no one's come to anybody and said, thank you for that vaccination. You know, I'm really glad I didn't get polio. Um, but you should be glad. Um, the other thing is that politically, when it comes time to allocate money, patients are much more effective in our political system than healthy populations. It's just the way it goes. Politicians tend to respond to dramatic cures and less so to um, just preventing disease. And for that reason, maybe that's not the reason exactly, but you won't find many epidemiologists among those getting Nobel Prizes. Um, so uh, I think personally that's uh, a disgrace, but um, that's the way it works. Epidemiologists worry about bias, which is in a simple definition, systematic deviation from the truth. Um, in our studies, we worry about a lot of factors that can make the results skewed. Um, and one of the key ones is participation rates. Who participates in a study? We want our study subjects to be representative, the sample that we study to be representative of the population from which it comes. And that's important if we want to generalize to the larger population. So um, I did a lung cancer study in Italy, and the site visitors came. Remember those site visitors I talked to you about? And this study was going to cost about $12 million. And so they reviewed the study and said, um, nice idea. It was the first, the largest lung cancer study in the world, one of the first studies to incorporate um, blood collection, uh, also tissue collection. So by the way, that tissue now is absolutely invaluable. We collected fresh frozen tissue from the operating theater. Anyway, they said to us, you know, if you can't get your response rate over 50%, so that your lung cancer cases are representative of the general population, you can't do the study. You know, we don't, we don't want that. So we did a phone survey where we called people up and said, 
hey, how'd you like to be part of a study in which we'll give you a questionnaire? It only takes about an hour, and we're going to take about 70 cc's of blood. Oh, yeah, and you have to sign an informed consent that's the size of a telephone book. Um, amazingly, only 30% agreed to do that. So we added invitation letters, phone follow-up. We offered to study them in the hospital. We put advertisements in all the local newspapers. We gave them a cash award. We got a letter from their physician, um, and we still only got to 49%. Finally, we got extremely charming interviewers of the opposite gender. Um, we used a physician call. We gave them gas coupons, which in Italy was a big, wonderful thing, 20 euro gas coupon. That was big. We had the local night show, the 11.30 night show, the equivalent of Johnny Carson at the time, uh, have TV ads. We had a better invitation letter, which was oriented towards a sixth grade education. We got a letter from the mayor. They actually liked the mayor in Milan, and a toll-free telephone line. And that got us to the participation rate. So it was not easy. And when you read about participation rate, realize it takes a lot to do that. It's actually the series of studies to do this cost about the first million dollars of our study. OK. Epidemiologists are obsessed with controls. Population controls are the best. Um, in the olden days, we used to say the quality standard was random digit dialing. Oh, did you do random digit dialing to get your controls? How wonderful. You know, you get people at random. Well, random digit dialing doesn't work so well today. You get about a 2% response rate. Um, but still, it's worth a struggle to get controls. Um, and I don't want to go into all the details about controls, but you really want your controls to be comparable to your cases or your study um, is really invalid. And you don't want terrible controls, convenience controls that are biased by obvious differences in age, risk factors, ethnicity, education. So you, know, you don't want to go into your laboratory freezer and just take out anything that's from a human. That's not a good way to do controls. OK, so if you call an epidemiologist as a consultant, and we love to consult. We love to be part of studies um, run by other folks. They're going to ask you, what was your study design? Where did controls come from? Did you collect key covariate data, meaning the factors that we take into account in the analysis, like how much did your people smoke? How old were they? Did they drink alcohol? Did you consider bias and confounding? What was your original hypothesis? What you don't like to see is that you do your study and then analyze every variable that you could possibly measure in the study for an association. That's called data dredging, and it's no, no. Um, did you do power calculations to figure out how big your study has to be? And did you validate your marker? So those are the kind of things that. And then the most common question that an epidemiologist get is, oh, my grandmother is 100. And she smokes, she drinks, all of her doctors have died. OK, she lives on bacon. Um, you know, how do you explain that? Explain that. Explain my grandmother. And the answer is, of course, it's a probabilistic science. OK, and anything can happen to one people. What we know is that in groups, the smokers are all going to die before the non-smokers. But there can always be a smoker at the end of that Gaussian distribution that lives a long time. God bless them. We want to study them and look at their genes. In fact, there was a study that got a lot of publicity uh, just recently that looked at 90-year-old smokers. It was very hard to find a lot of them, but they did find a few. And they claimed to find some genes that um, were associated with long life. I don't actually believe that study. but. Um, OK, so what kind of tools do epidemiologists use? And um, one of the tools that uh, we use are these cancer maps. And these were made by the uh, descriptive epidemiology folks in our division. And so this is a map of melanoma. And it's wonderful to see a map like this, because you just take one look. You could look at all the state registry data, but you take one look at this map, and you go, oh, look it. They're getting more melanoma in the south, OK? So it immediately suggests that sun has something to do with this. And so these maps are very, very helpful. And you might say, well, we, we knew that already. What else can you do? And I'll show you in a second. 
Um, there are no more advanced analyses of geographic data using GIS systems, geographic information systems. And a lot of analyses are done with SEER. The SEER registry covers um, all, about a quarter of the U.S. population. And um, it's SEER stands for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and End Results. And this is a organized registry of cancer data. And increasingly, this data is getting better and better, and it's being linked to other kinds of data. So SEER-based studies are really important um, part of uh, cancer epidemiology. And we're really glad that um, Reagan didn't stop this. this is one of the areas, you know, when they were looking for areas to cut, he said, what is this? You know, why do we care? Why is the government involved in this? Well, um, you know, SEER, if you look at the studies that have come from SEER, it's extraordinary how much um, wonderful information we've learned from SEER. And there's a website that you can visit and you can download data and make your own graphs and make your own tables if you're interested. And the kinds of things we can learn from SEER, um, uh, for instance, you look at this incidence rate in men and the incidence rate in women, and there's a bump around 1992 in men. And you might say, wow, what, what happened to the men there? What, what changed? You know, what, did they, was there an epidemic of cancer? Does anyone know what caused that? Well, the answer is um, it was due to PSA screening for prostate. So this was a bias in the data. It was a little blip um, that they introduced PSA screening and a lot more people um, were identified with prostate cancer. Uh, it didn't necessarily affect prostate mortality. It's not certain that all of those cancers were destined to progress, but uh, it's one of the little uh, features you have to take into account. So uh, SEER data uh, gives you very good information on um, uh, cancer rates by, by ethnicity and gender. And again, you can see that in the males, particularly in the black males, uh, there's that bump due to prostate cancer. You don't see it in the women. And differences between cancer incidence and mortality can inform uh, a lot of other things like the success of treatment. So the reason for this difference in children is that we're very good at treating childhood cancers. If you do that for pancreas cancer, you don't see uh, a big difference because we're not so good at treating pancreas cancer. Okay, well, one of the challenges to epidemiologists is causation. How do you prove causation? Because if we're working with statistics, what we get are statistical associations, correlations, and as you know, correlation doesn't prove causation. So epidemiologists have some classic criteria to try to infer causality. You don't prove causality from this, but you can gather evidence in favor of it. And the, the criteria are it's more likely to be causal if it's associated with a high risk. So a, a relative risk of 1.02, a 20% increased risk, 1.2, I'm sorry, not so impressive. A relative risk of 10, tenfold greater risk, 1,000%, okay, that's, that's much more impressive and much more likely to be causal. It should be consistent. We'd like to see it in different groups, in different populations, in different countries. We should see a dose response. If you increase the amount of the exposure, you want to see an increase generally in the amount of the cancer. You want to have something that makes sense temporally. The factor that you think is causing the cancer should come before the cancer. If it doesn't, that interferes with causality. And finally, you'd like to have biological plausibility. I just want to mention that there are additional approaches that have been used more recently in epidemiologic studies to infer causality. One of them is Mendelian randomization. That's the idea that if you find that a series of genes um, are associated with an exposure, and those genes are also associated with the cancer, it can weigh in in the argument that um, that particular 
factor is not just an association, but um, a causal factor. Molecular epidemiology refers to using biomarkers in the context of epidemiologic studies, and that allows you to look at mechanism, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Mediation analysis is, is similar to Mendelian randomization. So here's some data that, the kind of data that was very compelling in proving that smoking was a true cause of lung cancer and not as some scientists and some famous scientists and a lot of industry shills argued that, no, 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 cigarettes have nothing to do with lung cancer. You know, it's just that more risk-taking people smoke and, you know, they tend to get more cancer. Um, so here you have cigarettes smoked per day in three different cohort studies and rates of lung cancer. And as you can see, there's a strong and consistent association. And here you have the temporal factor that the average number of cigarettes smoked um, followed. You had male smoking and female smoking, and then female lung cancer rates going up following the female smoking, and male lung cancer rates following the male smoking. So that's temporal. And then you had biological plausibility, and this was the study of Oscar Auerbach, who actually attached beagles to smoking machines and showed that the histopathologic changes in the bronchial epithelium um, were very, very similar to humans with cancer and occurred after cigarette smoking. So that was a you know, very compelling mechanistic and biological argument. And finally, um, another study from three large cohorts showed that when people stopped smoking, the rates of lung cancer over a 20-year period slowly returned almost to baseline, never quite, but almost. The rates of uh, myocardial infarction take only about six months to come down, but for lung cancer, it takes a lot longer. Okay, so what are some accomplishments of um, epidemiology? And it looks like there were none. Okay, so I didn't mean to stuff this in, but in DCEG over the last year, there were 500 publications and a lot of press calls. And here's one on uh, coffee drinking and uh, total cancer mortality. I'm not gonna talk about it. It got a lot of media calls. Actually, I did a study uh, with a large team a few years ago, and we got hundreds of media calls identifying some of the genes associated with uh, coffee drinking. Okay, and here's another one on smoking and risk of bladder cancer among men and women. I don't really want to go into these. Over the decades, um, there have been studies and a lot of controversy about silicone breast implants, the Chernobyl accident, uh, oral cancer and mouthwash, abortion and breast cancer, cell phones and brain tumors, a lot of these were political. So in Congress, someone would have a constituency like Long Island women that said, well, you have to find out if all these chemicals in Long Island are causing us to get breast cancer, and they would mandate a certain study. And other groups of uh, Republican politicians wanted to show that abortion was related to breast cancer, which it wasn't. Um, so some of these studies were politically motivated, but um, we're a government group and we have to respond if they tell us to do a study. And the Fukushima disaster groups from our radiation epidemiology branch actually traveled there and helped a lot with um, both dosimetry and uh, following up on public health events. But I think that generally the most important accomplishments of epidemiology are that we've contributed to general and uh, an understanding of the general and specific causes of cancer. We're advocates of public health. Um, epidemiologists established through many, many studies and battles um, with industry and tobacco industry that tobacco was a causal factor for lung cancer. And that secondary tobacco smoke was also a risk factor, which is what resulted in the clean air legislation. So every time you go in a restaurant or get on an airplane, and there aren't people smoking next to you, you can thank um, epidemiologists. And molecular epidemiology is the idea that we can learn a lot more 
by including biospecimen collection and analyzing those biospecimens and analyzing the chemicals, the patterns, the genes um, to understand more about what causes disease. So very briefly, some highlights about general risk factors for cancer. Age is an important risk factor. Generally, environmental factors and genes and combinations of those are you know, the general causes of cancer. And it's often divided into three groups, uh, tobacco a third, diet a third, and everything else a third. We like to say that basically almost all cancer is due to the environment. And one of the lines of evidence in favor of this is that if you look at cancer incidence, according to the highest and lowest, that's the H and the L, the ratios are dramatically different. Okay, so the rates of melanoma, much, much, much higher in Australia than Japan. Now, those of you that are astute would say, well, wait a minute, um, you know, the Australians are Anglo-Saxon, red-haired, uh, Northern European extraction, you know, much more sensitive skin, and the Japanese are less so. And that's true. So genetic factors do contribute something. But most of that, those differences are environmental. Here's an example of an um, environmental factor. Uh, Zhenhui province in China has the highest rates of lung cancer in the world. And if you go there, this is what you find. Tremendous amounts of indoor air pollution. A lot of air pollution in general in China. And when you take away that indoor pollution, part of what's happened there in the last 10 to 15 years is that they've installed uh, measures to control that pollution indoors. The rates of lung cancer and the rates of COPD have gone down. So here's an example from one of the cancer maps. And I don't know where the cancer map is. I thought I had it on the slide. But basically, there's an area in Montana that has a little red dot. And it turned out that um, that dot was from a copper smelter that had arsenic contamination. And so that was accelerating the rates of lung cancer in that area. And when you got rid of it, you got rid of the uh, rates of lung cancer. Tobacco is still a gigantic public health problem. We shouldn't forget it. Uh, you can read all the statistics, but the one that impressed me the most is that in the last century, we had 100 million deaths from tobacco, and that's a big, big number. But it's projected that in the next century, we'll have a billion. That's tenfold more. And you might say, well, how is that possible? Because adult smokers in the United States, most recent data approaching 15%, and we used to be at 50%. And the answer is, it's not in the United States. It's in the developing world. It's in China and India um, and the Middle East and Africa. Africa's you know, a new and emerging market for cigarette companies. So we really have to do a lot more. I mean, it's mega death um, due to tobacco. And here's how the rates of smoking have dropped in the United States since the Surgeon General report. It takes decades for epidemiologic findings to reverberate, and it takes a long time to correct incorrect findings. So for example, you still see, walk into the grocery store and you still see low fat food, as if low fat food was something that might be good for you. In fact, low fat food is a disaster, as you can see from the rising obesity rates in the United States. But it takes a long, long time to um, for these results to change. And it will take a long, long time to change the dietary habits in the United States to affect um, healthy change. I, I need to give a little nod to the folks who worked on environmental tobacco smoke. Because as I said earlier, it was the discovery that environmental tobacco smoke was definitely related to lung cancer and other smoking-related conditions, particularly in children, that allowed it to be classified as a class A carcinogen and allowed um, clean air legislation that cleaned up our buildings and our workplaces and our airplanes and our movie theaters and our restaurants. You notice this when you go to Europe. 
or even certain parts of the United States where they're kind of lagging behind, that it's really a pleasure not to have the cigarette smoke around. Okay, so I should at least mention that um, the number two carcinogen after alcohol, uh, after uh, tobacco is alcohol, and it's associated with a number of major cancers. Ionizing radiation associated with leukemia, breast, lung, thyroid, head and neck cancer. A lot of studies of ionizing radiation and cancer in our radiation group. And I really want to just touch on these. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm not going to talk about Chernobyl. Uh, Non-ionizing radiation associated with all sorts of skin cancer. Um, tanning beds have managed to um, you know, still exist. I don't know why. Clearly associated with melanoma. Um, but the effect of the sun that's more effective in getting people to protect is the aging effect. So, um, and infections and cancer are uh, very, very important. And a major victory for epidemiology was understanding that the association of cervical cancer with increased sexual activity was actually due to the human papillomavirus. And um, the fact now that we have a vaccine that you can use to prevent that virus is a gigantic um, advance. OK. And I'm not going to talk uh, a lot more about these, um, except to say that uh, study of the human microbiome allows us to uh, detect and dissect the effects of infections that are not clinically apparent. And this is an emerging uh, important area that we'll hear a lot more of over the next few years. Uh, we don't think about occupational exposures a lot, but um, they're very, very critical. And a number of cohort studies uh, in our group, including studies of farmers, um, have elucidated the effect of um, a number of herbicides and insecticides on um, variety of human cancers. In fact, the study came out this week of the ranch hands, um, which are the Vietnam veterans that handled the herbicides uh, in Vietnam that were contaminated uh, with dioxin. And they showed that the rate of uh, MGUS, a precursor to multiple myeloma, was uh, two to threefold higher in folks exposed to dioxin. And so uh, MGUS is a universal precursor of myeloma. So this is really good evidence that um, that particular chemical um, is one of the risk factors for myeloma. And here's that uh, diesel exhaust study that I mentioned uh, earlier, and that uh, after taking into account smoking and other risk factors, they were able to show that diesel exhaust um, uh, was a major uh, cause of cancer. OK, so what are the challenges um, in epidemiology? Well, there are some big gaps. Um, among them are the fact that there are some cancers for which we don't know that much about the cause. In particular, we don't understand what are the extrinsic environmental risk factors. Um, we also don't know much about gene environment. So there's a lot of publicity about gene environment, and gene environment is theoretically important, since we know that broken genes um, are part of the origin of cancers. And so the environment must act in some way on those genes, and we understand that for a few cancers, but gene environment interaction is poorly understood. For instance, um, as many as one in seven lung cancers in women uh, are occurring non-smokers. And you would think that likely has a genetic etiology, but whatever that is, is not very well understood. So here's one of my favorite cancers. Uh, most common leukemia in adults in the West, 30% of all adult leukemia. Um, 
no extrinsic environmental factors are known. So that's a real problem. Another big controversy is diet. So you'll hear diet spoken about a lot as a um, risk factor for cancer. And there are some components of diet that are well known to be associated with cancer, like um, aflatoxin and liver cancer in India. But the precise dietary risk factors um, have, are not well known and have been, it's been fraught with difficulty in studying them. So uh, we understand that high calories are associated with uterine cancer, obesity. Low fiber may have something to do with colon cancer. Micronutrients, I'm sorry, it's been really, really hard to show that low B vitamins, low selenium, um, beta carotene, any of these factors really impact cancer. For example, in lung cancer, nutrient-based interventions, there was a gigantic cohort study in Finland, 30,000 male smokers, um, called ATBC, alpha tocopherol beta carotene. And the um, cohort was randomized between getting vitamin E and beta carotene. And many of you probably know the results of that study that the beta carotene actually increased the rate of lung cancer. So at the time, beta carotene, there were animal studies. You know, they were putting it in cereal. They were saying, this is the, the greatest stuff in the world. And then when the results of this study came out, you know, many, many millions of dollars spent on an intervention that actually did harm. So um, understanding the dietary causes of cancer, really important and, and really a challenge. A lot of controversy about processed versus traditional food. A lot of controversy about whether it's the large food groups like protein or carbohydrates versus the micronutrients. So that's an area that needs more research. We did a study in Italy um, uh, where we showed that by tertile of consumption, both fresh red meat and processed meat were associated with increased risk of lung cancer. But I'll tell you, that it's extremely difficult to adjust for correlated risk factors. So naturally, we adjust for smoking in this study. But the truth is that um, people who consume a lot of red meat tend to smoke more. And so it's very hard to adjust out those differences. So I'm not personally totally convinced that this is actually a correct finding. OK, well, actually, our group mostly focuses on genetics. So I will tell you that uh, there's a lot of gaps on the genetics side as well. As you know, genome-wide association studies have associated common genes with virtually every cancer and most human disease. The problem is that these associations tend to be weak. And when you plug them into risk models, they barely nudge the risk model. So in other words, if I want to decide who am I going to screen in the National Lung Cancer Screening Study so that I can have a group that's at high risk for lung cancer so that after I screen them, they're not a false positive. OK, I'm going to use genetics to help me. I've asked them already if they're a smoker. I've waited till they've gotten old. Maybe they have COPD. Um, OK, let's add their genes into that. Unfortunately, when you do that study, the genes don't have a gigantic impact. Also, I have to say that cancer families in complex diseases, and what do I mean by a complex disease? I mean a disease that is thought to have both environmental and genetic causes, not a rare genetic syndrome that mendelizes or you know, one gene is likely the etiology. Uh, for the complex diseases, even with cancer families, we have a hard time. So currently, we have over 50 multiplex CLL families. And we've done linkage analysis, and we've done exome sequencing. 
and we still can't find a gene that accounts for CLL in these families. It's very difficult. Okay. So I'm not going to tell you a lot about um, genetic studies. I think you know that um, there are germline changes that are inherited and there are somatic changes that are found in the tissue. And there are family studies, which is where you look for rare genes that are determinant in causing disease. Whereas you look in the population for common genes that only increase at absolute risk a little bit, are not so clinically important, but can be mechanistically important. And there are candidate and agnostic approaches. 15 years ago, really before 2007, we did only candidate approaches, but after that we've done agnostic genome-wide approaches. And the genome-wide approaches have paid off because we found many new and unsuspected families of disease, families of genes that are associated with cancer. Family history is an important risk factor generally, and it was one of the reasons that we were able to justify doing population studies of common cancers. So when you look at lung cancer and you look at family members, if you have a family member with lung cancer, your risk of lung cancer increases twofold for the mother, 1.37 for the father. For any family member, 1.57, that's a 57% increased risk after taking into account all the other risk factors. So family history by itself is a pretty significant risk factor overall. As I said, for rare genes, you need families. And a lot of uh, tumor suppressor genes were cloned from family studies. And this is the kind of diagram you see with um, a genome-wide association study. Um, we have a long way to go, even for cancers where we know a lot about the cause. Um, the treatment of lung cancer is still rather difficult. Uh, Five-year survival, only about 15%. Targeted therapy, really still not having a big impact on mortality. Um, screening for lung cancer, incredibly expensive and problematic problems with false positives. So um, we really have a long way to go. And one of the ways that epidemiology helps Traditional epidemiology, I think, I've told you, gives people a questionnaire, assesses their exposure, associates it statistically with disease, and based on that, assesses the factor that you measured as being important. Molecular epidemiology takes the next step and characterizes exposure by a biomarker, and then tries to determine dose, early biological effects, altered structure of function, early disease, and disease. Essentially, it's been described as entering the black box between exposure and disease. So that study I told you about in Italy, we actually collected blood, um, and we went into the operating room, got the tissue, took out the clinical sample, got the pathologist to get us as many as 10 pieces of tissue. We got tissue distant from the tumor. We got tissue adjacent to the tumor, and we got the tumor. And that's all being sequenced now. And of course, we also incorporated all the latest questionnaire effects. This is 10 years ago now, and one of the latest questionnaire attempts at, at the time was not only do you ask people about what they ate, but you look at doneness because the idea was the um, amount of certain classes of carcinogens, like arylamines, is proportional to the time and temperature at which it's cooked. So we'd ask people to look at the doneness of their meat and point to how they like their meat. And you know, so that was that study that I told you about before. It was useful. So this molecular epidemiology approach has contributed a lot of things. Uh, for one, we now understand, because we're able to analyze the blood samples on people that we thought had HPV, 
or that we, in the past, we inferred that they might have HPV by asking them or by asking their sexual history. Now we know 100% of them have HPV. Uh, we know that cutting down on smoking is not a very good idea because you compensate. And you may not compensate in the number of cigarettes you smoke, but you compensate in the time that you smoke them, in the way that you inhale, the way that you retain the smoke, the way that you hold the cigarette. And of course, we have GWAS and other biomarker studies, which are really good. So the latest wrinkle on molecular epidemiology um, is that we also look at behaviors, and we also look at outcome. So it's also nice to know if all those biomarkers and genes that we mentioned are related to whether you live or die. So I said 15% of lung cancers have long-term survival. Well, which 15% and why? Wouldn't it be great if we knew ahead of time which ones they were so we could give them more intensive treatment? So that's the aim of this integrative epidemiology. And we've done some cool studies on this behavioral side um, by collecting all this information about the way they smoke and their mood. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Uh, the latest, um, not the latest, we've been doing this for a long time, is that uh, we now combine our data more readily in consortia. This is a big advance because you can get data, and um, if your study is not powerful enough, well, you combine with your friends and uh, you have a much larger study. FENX is a um, online questionnaire. So if you decide to do a study in a certain area, you might want to use a questionnaire that's been used by hundreds of other groups and been vetted. Uh, so you can go there and get questionnaires on virtually anything. It's really good. OK, so I already mentioned some of the gaps in understanding of exposure. One of the ways we fill these gaps, and I'm going to conclude here and give you at least a minute or two for questions, is that we use emerging technologies to query exposure areas that have been inaccessible so far. So I tried revising these slides. Literally, I could revise these slides every two weeks and not quite be up to date. Here's sleep. I, I mean, I bought a thing called Misfit a few weeks ago. I broke it after two weeks, but it gave me a beautiful assessment of how much I sleep. Why do I care how much we sleep? We just analyzed NHANES data, which is nationally representative sample. It's not very good for cancer, but it's great for in-depth clinical and questionnaire information. Anyway, it was very clear from this data that if you sleep seven to eight hours, if you sleep six hours, your weight is greater your waist is greater, um, and that's after adjusting for exercise, diet, carbohydrates, fat intake, calories, smoking, age, and gender. If you sleep six hours or less than six, at six hours you drop off the cliff. And virtually everyone that sleeps less than six hours is obese. It's amazing. So there's something about sleep that's profoundly important that hasn't been studied because it's difficult to study. You ask people how they sleep, and they give you funky answers. But if you have an actigraph, if you have an active technology measure, you can get much better, much more in-depth, much more precise stages of sleep. So it's an extraordinary advance. Yeah, here's that misfit thing. I broke mine after like a week, but it's still an amazing technology. Physical activity. So you all have phones, and you do the S health, and you get the number of steps you did per day. And that's light years better than saying to someone, do you exercise a little bit or a lot or moderate? You know, that's useless. This is spectacularly more informative. Vital signs, heart rate, 
So heart rate variability, thought to be related to a number of conditions, can now be assessed very precisely. Social factors in Framingham. By looking at your friends, you can tell a lot about your diet, about obesity, about a number of factors. This, this is in its infancy, but it's something that um, will be investigated a lot more. Location, geography has an enormous impact on health. And uh, I don't have time to tell you about some of the studies we're doing in this area, but your zip code, just like your zip code is what um, the political analysts look at to determine how, how you're going to vote and whether it's worthwhile spending money in your zip code to convince you to vote for someone, it's related to health factors as well. And it's been very much understudied in traditional epi designs. Uh, smoking, well, we do a pretty good job with smoking, but um, there are technologies that can help you gather more information and technologies that can help you quit. Uh, I'm interested in weather and climate and um, pollution, the impact of weather on food, characteristics of the water, uh, the biosphere, the amount of sun exposure um, are all understudied areas that impact our health. And finally, last but not least, circadian variation. Circadian variation is immensely important. And yet it's difficult to study in an epidemiologic context because I can't ask you, hey, is your internal clock messed up? You know, I can ask you if you slept well the other night, but in animal models, if you disrupt circadian variation by taking out the pineal gland or um, causing trauma to the suprachiasmatic nucleus or uh, interrupting the optic tract or doing something that disrupts your internal time, uh, four things happen to the animals. They gain weight, their mood is disrupted, they get metabolic disturbances like diabetes, and eventually, and they have effects on tumors, particularly tumor progression, but also tumor incidence. But studying that in humans is very, very difficult. We use surrogates for circadian disruption, like asking you, hey, are you a shift worker? Um, if you're a shift worker, I'm inferring that your circadian timekeeper is disrupted. Um, what we are trying to do is use metabolomics to develop a blood test for body time. So we're working on that right now with the sleep lab, and I'll let you know how that turns out next year. Okay, this is a great place to stop where we still have a, a few minutes, and if you all have any questions, I'd be really happy. Okay, so there has been a lot of um, information on alcohol. Um, probably the most information has come out uh, because of the controversy about whether alcohol is truly causal for breast cancer. It's very well established that alcohol is associated with breast cancer, but whether it's causal and precisely how it's causal is not so well known. And so uh, there's a lot of wrestling with what the recommendation is. And, you know, there's some people that also contend that alcohol may have some health effects at very low levels. Currently, the recommendations are, and my memory serves me, is that one drink per day or less for women, men get two. Um, but it's clearly, it clearly is a breast cancer risk factor, and they have done that Mendelian randomization analysis that I told you about, and it seems to suggest that it is uh, causal. Um, it's very, very clear that it's associated with liver, liver cancer and uh, esophageal cancer. So the data there is, is absolutely unequivocal. Um, why we don't hear more about it, I don't know. We probably should. Probably because um, 
you know, people like to drink, and also there are a lot of, you know, big companies that um, promote drinking. So, you know, turn on the TV, and half of the ads on Sundays are beer ads. So. Um, No, uh, it's the amount of alcohol. So obviously you have to drink lower volumes and if it's liquor, but as far as I know, the data on liquor versus wine versus beer, in spite of some minor differences, um, the idea that uh, wine can contain some compounds in grapes, resveratrol, that's healthy. You know, that doesn't make that big a difference in epidemiologic studies. And, that the risk turns out to be related to the absolute quantity of alcohol consumed and not the particular source of the alcohol. Yes? So, what are the outcomes in versus federal or state trials that are short of the hypothesis? How does that? Okay. Repeat the question. Okay. The question is what about data dredging in GWAS where you have as many as 300,000 to, with imputation, 30 million genes. So because you're starting with so many genes to test, you're going to find some associations automatically. How do you get around that? And the way statisticians have gotten around that point is by establishing what they call a genome-wide threshold. And you don't believe any associ association you see unless the p-value is less than that genome-wide threshold. And how is that established? The assumption is made that there are, uh, you do what's called a Bonferroni correction, which is you take the traditional 0.05 p-value and you divide it by the number of tests. And we assume that there's about a million uh, genes that are tested, um, or SNPs, of course, more than one SNP per gene, you divide that into the p-value, and you get something around 10 to the minus 8. And so for an association to be considered proven in a GWAS study, you have to exceed. You know, when I say exceed, it looks like it's getting higher. But the p-value has to be less than 10 to the minus 8. I can't tell you the number of cool genes we've seen at 10 to the minus 7. And they just go in the trash bin. Um, we know there are some true associations mixed in there. But unless it's less than 10 to the minus 8, you ain't getting it published. So that's how that's dealt with in GWAS. What about bacteria in the gut? This would vary from one part of the world to another. OK. <laughs> so uh, folks are going crazy now wanting to do microbiome studies of the gut to find associations with cancer. And things like, let's sequence H. pylori, which is associated with a number of GI cancers, and let's see you know, how does the sequence of H. pylori vary? You know, and then there's all these other hypotheses about a leaky gut. Is it a leaky gut due to certain constituents of the diet? Some would say gluten, although many would say, no, that's not true. Um, but is that leaky gut associated with cancer? That's an area that has not been well investigated. <laughs> Next time, stay tuned. There's always more to do. There is. Thank Thanks you, Dale. Lot, Email me if you have more questions. So we're having technical difficulties. Um, what Neil had to do is he had to use two pointers, one for this one and one for that one. Okay. Gosh. Okay, so our next speaker. Check one, two, one, two. Okay, our next speaker is Kieran Dunleavy. He uh, got his medical degree at Dublin Medical School in 1994. Subsequently, he did additional fellowship training at the Matter and St. James Hospital in Dublin. He came to NCI in 2002, and he's currently a staff clinician in the lymphoid malignancies branch. He's going to talk to us today about lymphoma. Kieran.
down to them. Okay. So we're using both. Okay. We have to use both. One for the air, one for the key. Yep. Um, yeah, they're both forward and back at the same time. Okay. All right, thanks for the introduction. My name is Kieran Dunleavy, and I work at the National Cancer Institute, and um, I'm a lymphoma specialist. Uh, so I'm going to talk about lymphomas over the next 45 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll have some time for questions. Um, for the first part of this talk, I'm just going to talk about lymphomas broadly, what they are, what the different types are. Um, and then for the latter part of the talk, I'm just going to talk about some work that we're doing and others are doing uh, in the field. Um, so um, if, you th if you think about lymphomas in the context of other cancers, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are the fifth most common cancer in males um, and the sixth most common cancer in females. So I mean, this shows you how common they are compared to prostate cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer. So um, you know, they're nowhere near as common as these other solid tumors. Uh, so they're actually pretty rare diseases. Um, and uh, if you look at the difference between non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma, most lymphomas are non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, about 83%, and about 17% are um, Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, Hodgkin lymphoma usually occurs in younger females, um, and most patients present with a mass in the chest. And um, over this talk, I'm principally going to focus on non-Hodgkin's lymphomas because they're a lot more common. And the most common type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma is called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So I would principally talk about that um, over this talk. So um, in the US, there are approximately 75,000 new cases of non-Hodgkin lymphoma um, diagnosed every year. And the, the biggest risk factor for the development of non-Hodgkin lymphoma is increasing age. So if you look at people over 65 and under 65, um, for those over 65, the incidence is about 68 per 100,000, and it's 8 per 100,000 for people over 65. So you can see that these are diseases of older people for the most part. But they do affect patients of all ages. They affect children. They affect young adults. But most people are over 60 when they're diagnosed with uh, these diseases. Um, and shown here are the incidence rates of non-Hodgkin lymphoma in the U.S. over the past 25 or 30 years. And in men and women, the incidence of non-Hodgkin lymphoma has been um, increasing, um, as you can see here. But the good news is that the death rates from non-Hodgkin lymphoma in both males and females um, has been decreasing. And I think that's because we have developed um, improved therapies. Um, and uh, you can see that over the last 15 years, there's been a steady decrease in deaths from non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So why do people get lymphoma? Um, what are the risk factors? What predisposes you to it? Well, most people who develop lymphoma, there is no underlying etiology or genetic predisposition to it that we know of. But there are some things that can put you at a higher risk of developing lymphomas. Um, people who have altered immunity um, have an increased risk of non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, especially people who are HIV positive. So for um, HIV positive patients, the um, increased risk of the most common type of lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, is about 100 times more than people who do not have HIV. And there's another rare non-Hodgkin lymphoma called Burkitt lymphoma. And the incidence of that is increased by about 1,000 in people who have HIV. So that's one very important risk factor for the development of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And when a patient presents with symptoms of lymphoma, it's always really important to do a HIV test because um, it can be a presenting feature of HIV, particularly if they have diffuse large B cell lymphoma or Burkitt lymphoma. Other altered immunity conditions can also predispose you to lymphoma. Um, for example, inherited conditions like wiscott aldrich syndrome. Um, iatrogenic things can predispose you to lymphoma. So patients who have a history of a transplant, like a, a kidney transplant um, or a lung transplant, and they're typically on immunosuppressant drugs for a long period of time. And these can um, increase the risk of developing lymphoma. Some of those are associated with EBV and some are not. Um, patients who have had chemotherapy for other reasons, for other tumors, um, have an increased risk of developing lymphoma. 
autoimmune diseases um, are associated with an increased risk of lymphomas. So diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, lupus, and also the treatments of these, because these diseases are treated with immunomodulatory agents. And some of those have been associated uh, with an increased risk of lymphoma. And then uh, um, acquired immune stimulation is also associated with the risk of um, lymphoma. We heard a bit about infections, but Helicobacter pylori is associated with a particular lymphoma in the stomach called gastric malt lymphoma or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Um, hepatitis C is associated with lymphoma, and as I've said, HIV is as well. Um, there's not really a lot of very good studies showing a, um, an association between chemical exposure and the development of lymphoma, but it's obviously something that's really hard to um, investigate in any kind of meticulous way. Um, but I think it's very possible that organic solvents um, and other chemicals uh, are um, associated with an increased risk of the development of uh, lymphomas. So what about uh, some infections that cause lymphomas? Um, well, EBV is associated with a lot of different types of lymphomas. Burkitt lymphoma is um, rare. There are three different types of it. Uh, there's one type uh, called endemic, and that's the type that um, people in certain parts of the world get. So in equatorial Africa, children uh, usually between the ages of two and four develop this, and they present with big m masses in their neck and jaw. And endemic Burkitt lymphoma is associated with EBV in 100% of cases. Uh, the other two types of Burkitt lymphoma are also associated with EBV, but not um, as much as an endemic Burkitt. The other two types are sporadic Burkitt lymphoma, and uh, Burkitt lymphoma associated with HIV. And in, in both of those subtypes, uh, EBV is found in the tumor in about 30 to 40% of cases. EBV is also, as I said, important in lymphomas that develop after a, a transplant, be it a kidney transplant or a lung transplant or a bone marrow transplant sometimes. Um, HIV is obviously associated with AIDS-related non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, there is a disease that's seen in, again, particular parts of the world, in the Caribbean, for example. It's called adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma, and that is caused by the HTLV-1 virus. Um, and that's endemic in a lot of regions of the world, in parts of Asia as well. Um, and where that's the case, uh, these people have a much higher risk of developing lymphoma. Uh, for people who are HIV positive, uh, there's a, a lymphoma called primary effusion lymphoma, or PEL. And that's associated with the human herpes virus uh, 8, um, as is multiple myeloma. And as a, <laughs> hepatitis C is associated with lymphoblastic lymphoma. I've talked about helicobacter and this malt lymphoma, which um, occurs in the stomach. Um, and there are other infectious um, associations with different types of lymphomas, um, but these are the major ones that I've listed here. Um, so in terms of making a diagnosis of lymphoma, um, really it depends on the type of lymphoma in terms of how people present, but most people present with some kind of a swelling, usually of the lymph nodes. Uh, but we have lymphatic tissue in all organs of our body, so people can present really with symptoms or signs um, as a result of infiltration of either lymph nodes or organs. Um, and uh, a proportion of patients who present with, with lymphoma will have what are called B symptoms. And these are night sweats, fevers, and weight loss of over 10%. Um, and in, in, in certain types of lymphomas, those are associated with a worse outcome if you present with those. Um, but because these diseases can really affect any organ, they can affect the brain, they can affect the bone, um, they can affect the GI tract. So people presenting with lymphomas can have a wide spectrum of symptoms and presentations. But lymphomas are neoplasms of lymphocytes, either B lymphocytes uh, or T lymphocytes. And the field is becoming more and more complicated because more and more lymphomas are being um, classified and um, more of these uh, uh, er, er, um, areas are being broken down into subclassifications. Sub so, I mean, there probably are over 80 different types of lymphomas um, in the current WHO classification. And then lymphomas, as I said, are classified according to whether they come from a T cell or a B cell. And as I showed you, 85% of them are from B cells and about 15% are from T cells. They're also classified according to 
which part of the lymph node they originate from. So there's an area in the lymph node called the mantle zone, for example, and um, that's associated with mantle zone lymphoma. Uh, they're also classified by um, how, they, how they appear, um, the appearance of the cells. Um, and H Hodgkin's has a very distinctive appearance. Um, you see um, cells called Reed-Sternberg cells. Um, Burkitt lymphoma, which I talked about, it has a very distinctive appearance under the microscope. Um, it's called a starry sky appearance. You see lots of small lymphocytes, um, and they're very concentrated. And for pathologists, it's a pretty easy diagnosis to make because it's so distinctive. Um, more and more, we're looking at molecular features of lymphomas, and I'll talk um, you know, about this during the talk, uh, but really over the last 10 years, we've made significant progress in better um, understanding the genetic makeup of lymphomas and uh, which mutations are important and which are the driver mutations. And you know, that's becoming very exciting now because we now have a lot of small molecule inhibitors which can target specific subtypes of lymphomas and can target specific pathways that are you know, particularly bad and are driving these lymphomas to survive. Clinical features um, are also important. Um, at the end, I will talk about a pretty rare type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma called primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, but um, it develops in the mediastinum. It comes from a thymic B-cell, so um, almost all patients who present with this have a large mediastinal mass, and they usually present with um, cough, shortness of breath, um, and it's actually very closely related to Hodgkin lymphoma. About 80% of those um, also present with the mediastinal mass. So I'll talk about this at the end. But all of these things are very important uh, when the diagnosis of uh, lymphoma is being made. Has anybody got any questions so far? Okay. Um, so what about the breakdown of non-Hodgkin lymphoma? Um, as I said, most uh, of these are, are, are the most common t type is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma followed by follicular lymphoma. And after that, as you can see, the, the other types of lymphoma are pretty rare. About four or 5% of these are mantle cell lymphoma. T cell lymphomas are rare. They're much more common in um, Asia, but in the Western world, they're very rare. So you almost always see B cell lymphomas. So um, the two major types are diffuse large B cell and follicular. And I'll particularly focus on diffuse large B cell during this talk. And shown here is a lymph node. Um, and you, know, you can see the various parts of the lymph node. Uh, there are follicles and follicular lymphomas derived from follicles. Um, as I said already, there's, there's an area called a mantle zone, and you can get mantle zone lymphomas from there. There's a marginal zone. So different uh, lymphomas that arise in lymphocytes originate from different uh, parts of the lymph node. Um, and as I said, 85% of non-Hodgkin lymphomas are B-cell lymphomas. Um, and these derive from different stages of B-cell differentiation. Uh, so um, as you can see here, this shows B-cell differentiation uh, through the lymph node. Um, there's a pro-B cell, a pre-B cell, a naive B cell, then it goes into the germinal center. And uh, within diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, most of the lymphomas can be broken down into those that are derived from the germinal center and those that are called an act activated B-cell lymphomas. Um, and so depending on where the lymphoma originates from, um, it's different biologically um, and clinically, usually. Um, and this is a, is a busy slide, but it shows you that, so when, you know, when a patient presents with lymph nodes and the pathologist uh, looks at the tissue under the microscope and um, is, you know, appears like a lymphoma, uh, the way that they su subclassify it is typically by doing immunohistochemistry. So, and this has, you know, really changed in the last 10 or 15 years. So for all of these different types of lymphomas, there are certain, um, proteins that can be looked for on the cell surface. Um, for example, all B cell lymphomas pretty much express CD20, and there's a drug called rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody that targets that. So when a person presents with a tentative diagnosis of lymphoma, the pathologist will usually check for CD20, CD10, they'll check T cell markers, and as you can see, all of these different lymphomas have a 
different um, pattern of positivity and negativity of these immunostains, but these are very helpful. And 20, 25 years ago, pathologists didn't have these, so you know they had to make the diagnosis of lymphoma without the help of immunohistochemistry. So this um, has really refined the way that we can tell which of these diseases um, is going on. Um, and then, you know, for the pathologist, if um, if it looks like a particular type of lymphoma, then they could do certain cytogenetic tests. Um, going back to Burkitt lymphoma, um, close to 100% of tumors um, have got an 814 or a MYC translocation. Um, a lot of lymphomas, um, particularly follicular lymphomas, and some diffuse large B cell lymphomas have got a 1418 translocation. Um, and then other translocations can be looked for. There's a rare type of T cell lymphoma called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, and it can be divided into cases that are um, ALK positive and ALK negative. But if, if cases are ALK positive, and that is a protein that's expressed um, on the cell, and uh, there are immunohistochemical methods that can detect it. Uh, but these cases have got a 2-5 translocation. Um, so when the pathologist is looking at the initial tissue, there's no set paradigm about which of these things should be checked. But the immunohistochemistry is done first. And then depending on um, what the suspicion is of what type of lymphoma it is, some of these other confirmatory tests are done, cytogenetics and uh, oncogenes. Um, and after the, the a diagnosis of lymphoma is made, and it's, you know, it's uh, really important to say that it's um, very important to get the diagnosis right. Um, there are 80 different types, and a lot, of, a lot of infectious processes can mimic lymphomas. So it's really critical that uh, when the lymph node tissue or um, excisional biopsy tissue is being looked at by the pathologist, that the pathologist is an expert, that they see a lot of lymphoma cases, that you know, they understand all of the pitfalls and nuances of diagnosing these diseases. Because you know, we've seen several cases uh, you know, that appeared like lymphoma, and other, other centers had called them lymphomas, but they ended up being infections. I mean, that's not very common, but it still happens enough that it's really critical to have an expert hematopathologist uh, sign out the case. After the diagnosis is made, uh, these people should have a physical exam done um, with attention to the peripheral nodes and to the abdomen. Um, everybody should get a complete blood count done. Um, they should have their chemistries checked. There's a test called the LDH, or lactate dehydrogenase. Um, and that's a marker of tumor bulk. So um, it's something that we always check uh, when we newly diagnose patients with lymphoma. Um, as I said, everybody with a new diagnosis of lymphoma should have a HIV test done. Uh, they should also have a screening for hepatitis, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And the reason for that is that uh, hepatitis can predispose you to lymphomas, but uh, some of the therapies that we give can reactivate hepatitis. So you really need to know about it if somebody has a history of hepatitis before you start treatment. And if they do, you need to watch them very closely. They need to have their hepatitis viral load checked uh, on every cycle of treatment. Um, and if there's evidence that their liver function is deteriorating, then you need to pay attention to it very quickly because um, it can be very serious and sometimes even fatal. Um, all patients, when they're newly diagnosed, they get imaging done. Um, we typically do CT scans of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, and the neck, if that's involved. Um, you know, we're sort of moving away from using CTs. Uh, there's still st the gold standard. We, we also use PET scans. But there are other technologies that are in development and that are, are not associated with the degree of radiation that C CT scans are. So. Um, this area is um, evolving, I think. Um, it's not uncommon uh, to have involvement of, of the bone marrow when you have lymphoma. Almost all cases of follicular lymphoma, for example, have got bone marrow involvement. About 15 or 20 percent of cases of diffuse large B cell lymphoma do. So all patients should have a bone marrow, aspirate, and biopsy. And the reason for that as well is that they're, when you're deciding treatment for patients, um, if they have involvement of the bone marrow, it will sometimes prompt you to, for example, give tr treatment directly into the central nervous system, give intrathecal prophylaxis. So the patients with certain lymphomas who have involvement of the bone marrow have got a higher risk of progressing in the CNS. So the CNS should probably be checked. And 
you probably should at least consider giving intrathecal uh, t treatment, but that's quite controversial. I'm not gonna talk about that today. And then um, we use a staging system called the Ann Arbor staging system, and it's divided up into four different stages. Um, you know, stage one being localized disease, stage two being two or more lymph nodes on the same side of the diaphragm, stage three on both sides of the diaphragm, and then stage four, disseminated disease. Um, and this is uh, Im important. So when we see a new patient with aggressive lymphoma, um, I haven't shown it here, but there's something called the International Prognostic Index. Um, and it looks at five different characteristics. It looks at the age of the patient. It looks at the stage um, of the lymphoma. It looks at the LDH level, uh, something called their ECOG performance status, and also looks at the number of extranodal sites, uh, sites of involvement outside of lymph nodes. And uh, so several years ago, in a very large study, these five factors predicted poorer outcomes. So patients who had a high um, IPI score, a score of four or five. They had a much worse outcome when they got standard treatment compared to patients who had a lower score. You know, I would say that as we get better at understanding the molecular biology of these diseases, these older um, risk paradigms are not as relevant anymore, but they're, they're still predictive. But now, as, as I'll talk about in the next few slides, um, we have a lot of other um, things that we can look at that are also very predictive of outcome for patients. So as I said, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common uh, type. Um, if, if you look at the morphology of this, uh, this is a centroblastic variant of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And you see large cells. Uh, they're about twice the size of normal lymphocytes, um, vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli. Um, and the cells are uh, large cleaved or multi-lobated, and sometimes uh, they can be rich in T lymphocytes uh, as well, um, surrounding the tumor cells. And those are called T cell rich uh, diffuse large B cell lymphomas. So um, as I said, we've really made a lot of progress in understanding the molecular biology of lymphomas, and I'll, I'll talk particularly about uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So up until 10 or 12 years ago, um, you know, pathologists were able to say, yes, this is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, it has these particular markers. Uh, it's CD20 positive. It's CD10 positive. But they weren't able to say anything else beyond that. They could just say, you have diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So um, a group uh, in the US, which um, was led by Lou Stat and his lab at NCI, they um, and the group is called the Lymphoma and Leukemia Molecular Profiling Project. So it's a big consortium um, of people all around the US and Canada principally. And they looked at cases of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and they were able to break it down into three different diseases. So they um, looked at gene expression profiling. Um, in these cases, they looked at the differential expression of tens of thousands of genes. And when they did that, um, they found that this was not one disease, but actually three at least three different diseases. Uh, the, one was called the activated B-cell-like type, or ABC type. One was a germinal center B-cell-like, or GCB. And the other um, was primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. And uh, you know what they found was that um, these three subtypes um, all came from different stages of B cell differentiation. So the GCB type came from a germinal center centroblast, the ABC type from a plasma blast that was blocked during plasmacytic differentiation, and PMBL from a thymic B cell. And although PMBL or primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma is a type of non Hodgkin lymphoma, if you look at its molecular biology, it shares about a third of its genes with Hodgkin lymphoma, and it has a lot more in common with that. But these three subtypes, they're all characterized by different mechanisms of oncogenic activation. For example, in, in GCB lymphomas, uh, there's frequently a 14-18 translocation. In ABC lymphomas, um, you see constitutive activation of uh, the NF-kappa-B pathway, which I'm sure you've heard of. That's constitutively active in a lot of cancers. Um, and in primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, um, you see some NF-kappa-B activation and also um, 
increased expression of Janus kinase uh, genes particularly. And this is important because, um, you know, this work has really allowed us to identify so, some of the important targets within um, these subtypes of lymphoma that we can actually target and hopefully improve the outcome for patients with these diseases. So whereas before um, and still now we use chemotherapy um, and, you know, we've made a lot of progress um, with that, but the identification of distinct oncogenic mechanisms within these different subtypes has allowed us to develop novel therapies that are really very targeted and, 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 and can be used within a molecular subtype. So what about uh, the treatment of lymphomas? Um, again, I'll talk about diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. So the main treatment that we use for, for patients with this disease was developed back in the 1970s. Um, it was a chemotherapy regimen called CHOP. Um, and that stands for, C is for cyclophosphamide, H is hydroxydonorubicin or doxorubicin, O is oncovin or vincristine, and P is prednisone. Um, so this treatment was developed in the 1970s, and since that time, uh, people all over the world have been trying to improve upon the results that they got with CHOP back in the 1970s, and they've tried a number of different things. Uh, they've tried adding more drugs, they've tried intensifying them, doing bone marrow transplants, um, all of these different kinds of things. And so far, um, over the last 30 years, the only... Um, significant advancement that we've seen has been the addition of rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody against CD20. So in France, um, a group there did a randomized study in patients over the age of 60 years, and they hypothesized that adding rituximab would improve the cure rate um, of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So patients either got CHOP or they got CHOP with the rituximab. And as you can see, and this is a long-term follow-up of that study. Uh, there, there's a significant survival advantage for patients who got or CHOP versus those who got CHOP. Um, you probably think looking at this that the results are not very good, but this is long follow-up. And these patients are older patients. Um, but you can see that 36% of them are cured long-term with rituximab and CHOP. Um, but if, if you look at patients of all ages with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, uh, Shown here is overall survival and progression-free survival for patients of all ages. Um, but patients who are low risk by the IPI that I talked about, they do pretty well. But particularly patients who are intermediate or high risk, uh, even with standard treatment, you can see that a significant proportion of them are not cured. So, and today, RCHOP is still the standard treatment. It's still what most people will give you if you walk into an oncologist's office and you present with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. But there are a lot of very interesting trials and other strategies in development, and this might change soon. Uh, but this is important because, and you know, um, going back to the molecular biology, that has really allowed us to advance our thinking of what we should be doing to improve the cure rate of these patients. Um, I think one really important thing that the GCB, ABC, PMBL has showed is that patients uh, who have the ABC, where they have constitutive activation of NF-kappa B, they have a much, much worse outcome following standard therapy. So there in blue here, you can see um, overall survival and progression-free survival. And, you know, this is just one study that was done, but now several studies have been done. Um, so, and, you know, for researchers, it's... Um, it, important to identify this group of people because they really have a poor outcome with standard treatment. So we, re we really need to look at the biology of their tumors and think about um, how, what we should target and you know, how we can do that. Um, as I said, uh, these ABC lymphomas, uh, they have high expression of NF-kappa B target genes. These are 15 NF-kappa B target genes as shown here. And these are cases of uh, ABC on the left and cases of GCB on the right. Uh, red shows uh, high expression and green is low expression. But you can see the, these NF-kappa NF B target genes are highly expressed um, in the ABC subtype um, and not in the GCB subtype. Um, so a number of years ago, um, we did a study at NCI where 
we were really interested in developing new treatments for this ABC subtype, and we um, hypothesized that if we if we developed a target that was specific for NF kappa B or for something in the NF kappa B pathway, then we may see that patients with ABC did better than those with GCB, and these were relapse patients. So we did a, a study of about 50 patients. Uh, we used a drug called bortezomib, which um, is a proteasome inhibitor, but inhibits NF kappa B, and we gave it to the GCB patients and the ABC patients, but we found that the ABC patients um, ha had a much better outcome than the GCB patients. So that was a very small proof of principle study, but it suggested that you could preferentially target a subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And since the time that we did our study, uh, the field has got a lot more sophisticated. Um, and in ABC lymphomas, uh, we now um, have a much better understanding um, of the various mutations that drive NF kappa B. About 10% of these uh, lymphomas, and I'm sorry, this pointer isn't working, but is, I'm not sure if it's supposed to or not, but I'll, I'll just point. Um, about 10% of these lymphomas have got a CARD11 mutation. And we've known that for some time, but what is um, upstream of CARD11 um, has not been well understood until recently. But recent work has shown that chronic active B-cell receptor signaling is very important in driving um, NF-kappa-B in these ABC lymphomas. And about 20% of tumors have got mutations in the B-cell receptor. Uh, most of these are CD79B, some are CD79A. Um, and then there's another pathway that is also important in driving NF-kappa-B, um, and that's called the MITE88 pathway. And about 35% of um, ABC lymphomas have got mutations of MITE88. So that's very important uh, information in terms of thinking about what is the next step. Uh, so where chronic active B-cell receptor signaling is driving NF-kappa B, um, there's an interme intermediate uh, step or critical step, um, which is BTK or Bruton's tyrosine kinase. So you may have heard about ibrutinib. Ibrutinib is a an inhibitor of BTK, and um, I think it's a drug that has made the most difference uh, since rituximab in the treatment of lymphomas. Um, and it is very effective in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, in mantle cell lymphoma, and it's being investigated in a number of different lymphomas as well. But with respect to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, we hypothesized that using ibrutinib and inhibiting BTK um, might really interrupt uh, this lymphoma, um, especially in those cases where there are mutations in, in the B-cell receptor um, and in MITE88. Um, uh, that just shows you that ibrutinib covalently binds to uh, the BTK active site. So um, this was the hypothesis. So then, and this is work that was done by Lou Stout, um, both a ABC and GCB cell lines were treated um, with this agent uh, to test if it was preferentially killing ABC cell lines and not GCB cell lines. And that's what was shown. GCB cell lines weren't sensitive to it. ABC cell lines were. And interestingly, and as you would expect, those ABC cell lines that had CARD11 mutations were not sensitive to it. Um, and you would expect this because BTK is upstream from CARD11. So, um, Based on this rationale, um, we performed a study of, in 70 patients who, who had relapsed uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, they had both GCB and ABC. They got single agent ibrutinib. They got it every day until they had progressive disease. Um, and what the study showed was that uh, 15 of 39 patients with ABC um, had a response. Um, a number of them had a complete response, and just one patient with GCB had a response. Um, and shown here are the, are the, are the survival curves. Um, but if, if you look at overall survival and progression-free survival, they were both significantly better um, in the ABC patients. Um, I mean, these curves are not very impressive, but you, know, you have to remember that this patient population in this particular study uh, were heavily pretreated, most had had bone marrow transplants. Um, but the study did show that the ABC type did better with ibrutinib. 
This was one patient uh, from the study who had a, had three previous treatments. Um, and you can see this patient had a, a lot of disease in her abdomen. Um, and after three weeks of ibrutinib alone, you can see that there um, has been a big improvement um, in her disease. And one, you know, one very exciting part of this study that was done was um, we went back to um, look at mutational status and correlate that with outcome. And patients uh, who had mutant CARD11, for example, they didn't respond to ibrutinib at all, whereas patients who had mutations in MITE88 and in, in the B-cell receptor had a um, high response rate to it. So um, this is a very large study which has just um, recently finished accrual, um, uh, and eight, um, 800 patients have been um, accrued to the study. And the function of this study is to, in newly diagnosed patients, to compare ORCHOP, the standard, with ORCHOP plus ibrutinib. Um, and all of these patients um, have the non-GCB or the ABC subtype. So the results of this study will be available in 2017 or 2018. Um, but if there's a significant survival um, advantage in patients who receive ibrutinib, then this will become the standard for this particular subtype of uh, lymphoma. So I'm just going to um, move a little bit laterally. And uh, th there's a, a lymphoma that we have a lot of interest here called primary central nervous system lymphoma. So it's a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and it's almost always of the ABC subtype. Um, it's pretty rare, but as you can see, um, over 90% of cases of primary CNS lymphoma are diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Um, and it resembles the ABC subtype um, of nodal diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, the NF-kappa B pathway is typically active. Uh, CARD11 is mutated in a high proportion of cases. Um, and activating mutations of MITE88 are present. And B-cell receptor mutations like CD79 um, are common. And this is really interesting because on the left, these are the uh, percentage of cases that had a MITE88 mutation. But if you look at systemic activated B-cell lymphoma, just under 30% of cases um, have a mutation of MITE88. If you look at, there's a lymphoma called the cutaneous leg type lymphoma. About 60% have MITE88 mutations. For primary testicular lymphoma, it's about 60%. But for primary CNS lymphoma, it's close to 90%. So, you know, this is really interesting. So although these are called activated B-cell lymphomas, they are really different to the other activated B-cell lymphomas. Um, and they also have a very... Um, or a, a very high proportion of them have a mutation of CD79B. It's close to 70 or 80 percent. So we really thought about this um, and you know, thought that it would be very interesting to test ibrutinib um, in this lymphoma. Um, and this just shows you the um, overlap of MITE88 and CD79B in, in primary CNS lymphoma and in primary testicular lymphoma. Uh, yeah, so we thought that it would be, would be very interesting to see if ibrutinib is effective. We didn't know when we s started this study if ibrutinib crossed the blood-brain barrier, if it would work better in brain lymphoma than in systemic ABC lymphoma. And, you know, I've been talking to you mostly about systemic aggressive lymphomas, but um, if you look back at the, at the sort of treatment history of primary CNS lymphoma, uh, the treatment approach differs a lot from systemic diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And, the, you know, the main reason for that is that the drugs that we use, like CHOP, which I mentioned, they just don't cross the blood-brain barrier very well. Um, prednisone does um, a little bit, but the other drugs don't. So for the past 20 or 30 years, uh, people have used methotrexate-based regimens. Methotrexate is a chemotherapy drug, and it's effective, but... It's not very effective in systemic um, aggressive lymphomas. It has been tested in many trials, but it's not cured, um, curative enough that it's become standard treatment. But because it crosses into the, into the blood-brain barrier, it's been used um, as a standard in primary CNS lymphomas. Um, but if you look at the outcome for patients with this disease in general, um, 
it's a lot inferior to systemic lymphoma. And one thing about primary CNS lymphoma is that you see a lot of late relapses. So we don't typically see that in systemic lymphomas. But in primary CNS lymphoma, even if people are doing well at four and five years, um, our field is realizing now that a lot of people relapse between five and 10 years, for example. So, you know, I think what I'm saying to you is that it's very, very difficult to eradicate this disease. And we can use radiation treatment, and that can be very helpful, but that has really bad side effects. Um, it can cause cognitive problems. It can cause vascular problems. And these patients who have had radiation treatment are at um, a significantly increased risk of, de of developing stroke and things like that. So there's a real need to develop new treatments for this disease. Um, so we basically use the systemic treatment, um, the standard systemic treatment for large cell lymphoma as a platform and modified it. Uh, and we replaced some of the drugs um, or use drugs that were in the same classes, but that we predicted cross the blood-brain barrier. And we added um, ibrutinib to the regimen uh, and tested this in patients with primary CNS lymphoma. Uh, this lymphoma is um, seen in, in, in patients who have HIV, but in the setting of HIV, primary CNS lymphoma is almost always EBV positive, whereas in patients who don't have HIV, it's almost always EBV negative. So we confined um, our study to patients uh, who were EBV negative, who did not have EBV uh, in their tumor. And we wanted to look at the effectiveness of ibrutinib um, in this disease and also test this new regimen that basically modified drugs that we had previously used and um, in a way that they crossed the blood-brain barrier. We also plan to do mutational analyses for the various things that I've talked about and try to correlate outcome with that. So um, what did we find? Um, well, first of all, we did, we did PK studies um, in all of our first group of patients. And we found that ibrutinib did actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So patients uh, initially got ibrutinib alone. And uh, for the first day, they had PK levels done um, every two or three hours. Uh, and shown here are the results of those PK levels. Uh, and you can see that red is um, ibrutinib and green is its active metabolite. Um, and the two curves on the top um, in the first patient we treated and the second patient we treated, uh, those are both serum levels of ibrutinib and its active metabolite. And the two bottom curves are CSF levels of ibrutinib and its active metabolite. But this shows you that ibrutinib gets into the CSF for a significant amount of time. Uh, and these are the first four patients. We now have 12 patients on the study. Um, and this is looking at ibrutinib pharmacokinetics. And I guess what was interesting was that um, when we compared the um, AUC in the CSF to the AUC in the plasma of ibrutinib and its active metabolite, it initially seemed like very little of it was getting into the CNS. But in, in the periphery or in the serum, Ibrutinib is very highly plasma protein bound. About 97% of it is plasma protein bound. So, and that's not the case in the CSF. So if you actually correct for that, a significant amount of it gets in. So in these four people shown here, it varied from 21.4% uh, to 100%. Um, and this was the very first patient that we treated. Um, she was a 61-year-old uh, female. Back in 2010, she had symptoms of slurred speech, uh, aphasia, gait instability. Um, she ended up having an MRI of her brain, and that showed a left cerebellar lesion. It was biopsied, and it was consistent with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So as I said, the standard has been to give methotrexate, so she got high-dose methotrexate back in 2010. After that, she had progressive disease. Then she got whole brain radiation treatment uh, with another drug called cytarabine and had a response which lasted for three years. And then in the middle of 2014, she represented with symptoms again and was found to have a left temporal lobe lesion. Uh, and also in her body, she had a left perirenal nodule and bilateral adrenal involvement. And the biopsy showed recurrent primary CNS lymphoma. Um, so she went on our study and got 14 days of ibrutinib. So the way that our study is constructed is that Ibrutinib is given for 14 days, and then 
the chemotherapy drugs are started. And the, you know, the reason for that is to see, is this agent effective by itself in primary CNS lymphoma? And also, we do these PKs. So this was her response after 14 days. You can see that this uh, lesion um, in her left temporal lobe has significantly shrunken down with just ibrutinib alone. Uh, this was another patient we treated. This was a 65-year-old female. Uh, she presented with seizures. Uh, a CT showed a right parietal lobe lesion in her brain. Again, it was primary CNS lymphoma, and she was treated with high-dose methotrexate. And rituximab had a good response to that, but then she relapsed at the end of 2014 with new disease in her corpus callosum and right basal ganglia. And uh, you can see here she has a large corpus callosum mass. Um, and again, after 14 days of ibrutinib, there's been a, a very good improvement um, in the size of her lesion. Um, so this, you know, this is the outcome of the first six patients that we treated on our study, but um, all of them except for one where we couldn't evaluate it had a very good response to ibrutinib. Uh, and then many of them who have finished the Teddy Orr part of the treatment um, also had a good response. So we uh, you know, have, sh ha have shown so far that ibrutinib gets into the CSF and achieves meaningful CSF concentrations. Uh, and this new treatment, which um, is very different to the standards that have been used in the past, which have not been so effective, um, appears to be promising. And we're, our plans are to extend this to a multi-center study. So for the last part of the talk, just for the next five or 10 minutes, I'm just going to talk about uh, mediastinal B-cell lymphomas. Um, so, um, you know, at the beginning when I showed you the three different subtypes of, of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, this was the third subtype. Um, but as I said to you, although it's called a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, um, if, it, if you look at its genetic makeup, it has a lot more in common with classic Hodgkin lymphoma. They share about a third of their genes. Um, it's derived from a, a chymic B-cell. Most patients who get Hodgkin lymphoma and primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma are females in their 20s and 30s. Um, and almost all of these patients, they present with a mediastinal mass. Um, uh, so they often have a cough or shortness of breath. Um, and sometimes these B symptoms that I mentioned, night sweats, fevers, weight loss. Um, and it's interesting that um, we now think of mediastinal lymphomas as lying on a spectrum of diseases. So at one end of the spectrum, you have Hodgkin lymphoma. NSHL is nodular sclerosing Hodgkin lymphoma. And at the other end, you have primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, or PMBL. Um, and Hodgkin lymphoma is CD15 and CD30 positive, uh, whereas PMBL is CD20 positive. And then in between both of these entities, there are lymphomas that don't fit into Hodgkin lymphoma or primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. And these are called mediastinal gray zone lymphomas. And they have um, histologic and immunophenotypic features that are in between these parent entities and are transitional. Uh, and they're a, you know, a very interesting group of diseases. So how is this disease treated? Um, well, the optimal therapeutic approach is uh, controversial. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty rare type of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So there's a real lack of prospective studies. And uh, for the most part, it's been treated like other diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So RTOP, as I mentioned, um, has been widely used uh, as the standard. And also mediastinal radiation has typically been administered and still is to a high proportion of cases. Uh, and the cure rate for progressive or recurrent disease is very low. So it's really critical in this disease to make sure that you give patients the very best treatment at the beginning, because if the disease comes back, it's really difficult to cure. Um, and the reason that radiation is such a mainstay of treatment of this disease is that early studies that were done 20 or 25 years ago, they suggested that radiation was necessary. Um, if you look back at historical studies in this disease, dose intensity, um, as in using regimens that are much more intensive than CHOP, um, in retrospective analyses were associated with a much better outcome. Uh, so you had this impression that this disease should be treated with more intensive approaches than CHOP. Um, so what about the results of, of CHOP or, or CHOP in, in primary mediastinal lymphoma? Well, this is a, a trial called the MINT trial or the MAB-THERA international trial. 
Um, and they went back and they, this was, this was a trial of uh, six or 700 patients, but they had a subset of patients who had primary mediastinal lymphoma. Uh, they went back and they looked at the outcome of those patients. Um, uh, and you can see here their event-free survival and their overall survival, um, which don't look bad, but most of these people uh, received mediastinal radiation treatment. So, you know, considering that, I think this tells you with standard treatment, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in this disease. This was another study that looked at uh, RCHOP in primary mediastinal lymphoma from Mass General. They looked back uh, over 63 patients um, who got RCHOP. Uh, shown here are progression-free and overall survival. Again, most of these people received mediastinal radiation. Uh, and if they looked at patients with higher IPI scores, uh, as I mentioned before, those people shown in green and purple had a particularly poor outcome. Uh, and if they looked at patients who had disease outside their chest, if they had disease below their diaphragm um, or advanced stage of disease, those people um, had a pretty terrible outcome, as you can see here, the, uh, the, the blue curves for progression-free and for overall survival. So we were really interested a number of years ago in developing a new treatment for this disease. Um, for, for patients with um, early stage disease, they have a good outcome uh, with RCHOP, but most of the time radiation is used. And um, mediastinal radiation is sometimes called a gift that keeps on giving because um, it's, particularly when it's given to younger people, um, as they get older, their risk of various malignancies um, in females, especially breast cancer, but also ischemic heart disease um, is significantly increased. About 20% of females um, in their teens or 20s who get mediastinal radiation develop breast cancer. And a very high proportion of people who get mediastinal radiation get ischemic heart disease. So we thought it was really important to develop a novel strategy that did not use radiation treatment, but maintained high cure rates. Because as, I, as I've said, if this disease comes back, it's very difficult to cure. Um, so we tested the dose-adjusted EPOC-R uh, regimen in this disease. Um, that's a dose-adjusted regimen. Uh, we adjust the drugs based on how low the white count falls after every cycle of chemotherapy. And the idea you know, behind that is to n normalize drug exposure, and different patients metabolize these drugs differently. But you know, for most curative regimens, there's no strategy to ensure that you dose patients based on how they metabolize drugs. It's just based on their height and their weight. So this was uh, different, and we, we, you know, we felt that this would be particularly effective in this type of disease because historically, dose intensity appears like um, it is uh, important. So this was our treatment paradigm. Uh, we gave six cycles of this treatment, and then after that did a, a CT and a PET scan to establish if people were in remission or not. Uh, we treated 51 patients here, and 16 patients were treated at a different center. And we didn't use radiation treatment, and we found that the results were very good. This is the event-free survival without any radiation and the overall survival. And you can see that over 90% of people did really well uh, without any radiation treatment, and hopefully without any risk of these long-term toxicities that you get with radiation treatment. Um, there are now a lot of ongoing studies using the regimen in primary mediastinal lymphoma. Um, there is a study um, in Germany called the NHL BFM04 study where this approach is being used. Um, and uh, two years ago, they looked at the results of this study, and although the numbers were very small, they found similar results to what we had uh, found in our study. Patients with gray zone lymphoma don't have as good an outcome. Uh, these are our results using the same treatment um, in this disease. and. One of our focuses at the moment is to try to understand why, why the patients with gray zone lymphoma have a worse outcome. Um, and we're looking at the genetic makeup of these tumors. And you know, it appears that they have a genetic signature that's in between um, Hodgkin lymphoma and primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. Uh, but um, in, in, in Hodgkin lymphoma, for example, the dendritic cell signature is very important. And we see a lot of that um, in the cases of gray zone lymphoma that we've looked at. Um, as I've said, genus kinase pathways and signatures are important in these diseases, and there are inhibitors of genus kinase pathways in development. So these are interesting drugs uh, to use in the future in mediastinal lymphomas. So um, in conclusion, um, you know, I've really focused on diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but lymphoma is just a huge area with 
as I've said, over 80 different types of diseases. Um, but there are a lot of really interesting, I think, ongoing studies that are incorporating novel strategies based on um, our understanding of tumor biology. Um, and we've really made a lot of progress in that in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And the results of these studies, I think, may change the standard management um, of subgroups that are defined by biological factors. And I think in the future, um, molecular insights need to guide clinical trial designs uh, to test rational and optimal combinations. And the more information we have about the genetic makeup of these tumors, um, the closer we, you know, we're becoming to having an ideal situation like this where we can move forward. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions for the last few minutes. Thank you. No, I mean, so, I mean, it's been used in a lot of different types of patients at this point. The drug is FDA approved now, so, but it doesn't have a lot of, I mean, it has none of the side effects that you would see with chemotherapy. So, I mean, some people get nausea. It can cause some mild gastrointestinal problems. Um, a small proportion of patients get bleeding. Um, but for the most part, it's very well tolerated, and most people don't notice any symptoms at all. Yeah, there, had, you know, there, there have been lots of cases of resistance, and it's something that is being studied. Um, uh, so, you know, th I mean, that's a very interesting area with all of these novel agents because, yes, of course, um, resistance happens, and we're trying to understand why that is, what other pathways are turned on, is there a certain mutational profile that predisposes to resistance or not, o all of these questions, and. You know, in our field, we've been using chemotherapy for a long time, but I think the future is combining small molecule inhibitors and targeted agents, and a lot of the um, information we're getting from looking at resistance, I think, will help guide, uh, you know, or um, help us to decide which are the most logical combinations of drugs to use to avoid resistance and things like that, so... Okay, so you're saying to what degree can gene therapy be used in these lymphomas where there's a genetic predisposition, there's some, is that what you're asking? For, um, I mean, I think if, if the biology of the tumor is, if, if NF, NF kappa B is constitutively activated, I, I don't think any I, gene therapy approaches are going to be particularly effective, but I mean, there are lots of, I mean, you've probably heard of CAR T-cell therapy and, I mean, genetically modifying T-cells and reinfusing them back. And, I mean, there's a lot of work here uh, targeting CD19, doing CAR T-cell therapy with, and then CD19 is expressed on most of these aggressive B-cell lymphomas. So, but not specifically getting at the tumor biology. I think that's... So, yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a really good question. It's something that's being explored. There is, a, there, is, there is one type of lymphoma. It's pretty rare, but we've been in a position to really study it here because we have the most cases in the world. Um, and what we found is that, um, and again, the numbers are pretty small, but I think it's very interesting. We have, you know, been taking blood from patients. Um, this lymphoma is called lymphomatoid granulomatosis. And it's a lymphoma that is related to EBV. Um, but what we found is we've l looked at their blood before and after they get treatment. Um, and they get a treatment called interferon. And it goes on for about two years. And w when, we, when we look at their blood cells and look at their T cells and look at the CD8 compartment and do multi multicolor flow cytometry, uh, we found that when they're diagnosed with the lymphoma, they have um, senescent T cells. So if you look at markers like CD57 and PD1, 
um, they're very common in their CD8 T cells. And then when they're successfully treated and cured, the senescent phenotype reverses, and it's a healthy phenotype again. So, I mean, that's an example of, you know, of, of, of one study that we're doing. But it's pretty difficult to do these studies. But, but yes, it's really interesting, I think. And, you know, and I think especially EBV is a very interesting um, causative factor in a lot of lymphomas and a lot of these things can be done in the context of EBV that might be helpful even in cases that are not EBV positive, so. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not entirely clear. Is it like chronic antigen stimulation? Um, people have tried to study this, but and the, you know, there are lots of different hypotheses about it. But I think at the end of the day, it's, not, it's still something that is not completely worked out. OK, all right. Thank you. Thanks. There you go.